new state director, which I came to work uh, for RD in Alabama in, in uh, November of 2009. I, uh, this is a new arena for me because I, having been a, an employee of the USDA for 32 years, I worked in production agriculture. So uh, learning about new rural development was a whole new game for me, but it has become the most rewarding job I have ever had in my whole life, and I'm, I'm most appreciative of the opportunity to have it and to be a part of this administration that has put forth an effort to try to sustain our economy, improve our working environment, provide new jobs and infrastructure and highways and, and you know, looking for, for ways to make this country stronger and better. And, uh, and uh, it's a challenge, very much a challenge. And funding is a challenge. And, and one of the key things we learn every time, Renita Tatis, every time we go to Washington, our, our, the big word is partnership. You know, you, you've got to be able to put your funds together because everybody doesn't have enough right now to do it all by themselves. And uh, but we, we, we feel like we have some good partners. We have some good partners here today. Um, we, uh, we think that the people we brought to this table in the business section here will be able to provide some insight to you, help you understand what we do, how we do, and how we can be a part of what you do. So this time I want to introduce our panel. We got a, what do you say, maybe an hour and 15 minutes to pull this off, some more or less. So we're going to get started. Um, our first uh, speaker today. We'll, let, uh, we'll start by the way I got them listed here. Renita Dorr was appointed South Carolina State Director of U.S. State Rural Development by President uh, Barack Obama in August of 2009. Uh, she is a seasoned agency administrator. She is a passionate advocate of, on behalf of rural uh, communities throughout the state. In her position, she oversees multiple million dollar portfolio and community economic development projects and directs a staff of over 100 employees to fulfill an agency's position. And let me tell you, when you deal with 100 employees every day, uh, you earn your check. Uh, Ms. Doerr has brought to USDA a wealth of experience, having come from a, a background of rural development. She's very fortunate to have been one of the state directors that was appointed. Uh, that came out of, out of USDA, that had experience as an area director and a community uh, development specialist, and, and, and that's a that brings a lot to the table to start with so that you have some background in this. She's a very uh, active community leader, serves as co-chair of the South Carolina Rural Development Council. She also serves on boards of the uh, Beaufort Jasper Higher Education Commission, uh, the BB BNC Society of Christian Women, and South Carolina Women's Connection. She's a native of uh, Beauf Beaufort? Beaufort. Beaufort. Okay. I'm from Alabama, so. Okay. Buford, South Carolina. Ms. Doerr earned a uh, Bachelor of Arts in Journalism from the University of South Carolina. She received additional professional development from U USDA Graduate School and University of South Carolina Dalton Monroe School of Business and the Federal Executive Institute. Uh, she's also a mother, a housewife, and you throw all that in with being a state director, she got a full-time job plus one. So this time I want to introduce uh, Benita Doerr. And uh, we'll start from there. All right. Well, since uh, Rhonda's presentation is already up, Rhonda's going to go first. So. Well, then, <laughs> let me tell you who Rhonda is, and how about that? Um, Mr. Gurley, who is with us today, uh, is serving on our panel. Also, uh, uh, is, uh, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself, as he uh, uh, didn't have an opportunity to get to me his bio. but. Uh, I think he has a very interesting background in his career, and we'll let him tell you a little bit about him when he gets up to make his presentation. Rhonda Fisher, uh, who works for uh, Small Business Administration, uh, as a supervisor, lender relations specialist in the Mississippi District Office. Uh, uh, Rhonda provides leadership over a team of point of contact for the agency to, for the delivery of financial assistance and management technical assistance to small businesses in the state of Mississippi. Uh, she manages an imp implementation of key economic outreach programs committed to providing quality customer-oriented programs, services small business leaders, resource partners, and minority and veteran and women communities. 
primary focus is to assist small business in their fomentation of growth in order to create jobs and play a vital role in the economic development of Mississippi. That's a big job. Big job. And everybody just heard blah, 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 right? <laughs> Uh, but Rhonda has, this is a good thing, it goes back to depth of field. She has 26 years of experience working with SBA. And she has held many positions as, and across this agency, including a long liquidation assistant, and I know that's a tough job. Um, a loan specialist, chief, finance, chief of the financial division, lead marketing outreach specialist. Uh, uh, she has held many other civic uh, responsibilities throughout her career it brings to us a wealth of knowledge of, uh, of the Small Business Administration. And this time we're going to let her make her presentation. Rhonda. Thank you very much. Uh, if you need a resource guide, just raise your hand and Doug will hand you one. Everybody got one? Okay. So I was told I've got 15 minutes, right? I'm going to start you on the clock. Okay. Ready, set, go. Um, I'm going to take just uh, 15 minutes and I'm going to explain to you the programs and resources available to entrepreneurs from SBA. Uh, my primary responsibility is our loan program, so that's what I'm going to focus on with you today, is just the basic loan programs available through SBA. We are a very small, independent federal agency. We were created by Congress back in the 1950s with the primary purpose of um, aiding and assisting small businesses and entrepreneurs in getting into business, staying in business, and growing and prospering. So that's, that's our primary focus. As you all know, small business is the backbone of our economy, but what is it that small businesses need to get in business and to stay in business and to grow? What? Capital, that's right, it's very difficult. Uh, especially for a startup entrepreneur to gain that access to that capital. Uh, if they don't have the rich uncle that's willing to pledge the family farm, it's almost virtually impossible, especially in today's economy. Are there any bankers in the house? Nobody? Good, I'll talk freely then. <laughs> if, uh, you know, banks are in business to make money. Banks are not in business for economic development. They're in business to make money. Um, so for an entrepreneur, especially a startup, the mom and pop type shops, let's just say it's a convenience store on lease space, there's no collateral to secure the loan. The inventory that they're gonna purchase to sell out of the store is gonna be gone should the business fail. So it's very difficult for entrepreneurs to gain access to that capital. So one of the things that SBA does is guarantee loans that banks make uh, to small businesses. We partner with the banks, guarantee that loan that they make to that small business owner so it's kind of like Uncle Sam co-signing the loan with the, with the small business person. Our guarantee simply reduces the risk that the bank has in providing the financing to the small business because the bank knows that at the end of the day, should the business fail, then they've got Uncle Sam standing behind that small business person to provide the guaranteed portion of the loan back to the bank. So their risk on it. Our maximum guarantee is 85%, so with an SBA 85% guarantee, the maximum risk to the bank is 15% before any liquidation. So their risk is substantially reduced. We've got a variety of programs. They all operate under our what we call our 7A umbrella. That's the uh, section in the Code of Federal Regulations that our loan programs fall under. So all of our programs fall under 7A. Basic eligibility tracks down to all these different loan programs. And I'm just gonna to touch briefly on each of these just to give you a little information about the programs, what your appetite. The resource guides in front of you go into more detail and then for more information and detail, you can go to our website at sba.gov. Maximum loan amount uh, that we can guarantee is $5 million. It was previously $2 million. Um, the Jobs Act permanently increased our maximum to $5 million. There's no minimum, so we can do very, very small loans up to a maximum of $5 million under 7A. Loan requests at $150,000 or less are guaranteed at 85%. When the loan amount exceeds $150,000, our guarantee drops to, uh, drops to 75%. So on a large loan, the bank's risk is 25%. 
Basic eligibility, of course, we're not here to assist uh, Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's the smaller businesses who do not hold a monopoly in, the, in, in their work in their line of business. So they have to be considered a small business. They have to be an eligible type of business. And first and foremost is it's a uh, for-profit. We can't finance <coughs> a non-profit entity. So it has to be a for-profit. There are certain types of loans that we can't finance if it's a real estate developer or if the business's primary source of income is from rental receipts, whether it's just renting space, apartment complexes, um, some marinas where they're just simply leasing a boat slip would not be eligible. If there's a service component in, involved, uh, then we could finance it. So it's gonna depend on whether it's just the realm of space or are they actually providing the service. And then of course, uh, any legitimate business use of proceeds is eligible. The Jobs Act uh, changed our size standards. Previously, we used NAICS codes assigned to certain types of businesses, where if you were in retail, your average annual gross receipts had to be below a certain threshold, or if you were in manufacturing or wholesale, it was based on number of employees. We've simplified that, and now we say that if your uh, net worth is less than 15 million, that's pretty substantial. So we can we can finance pretty substantial businesses uh, with net worth of less than 15 million and net income of less than five million. We do charge a guarantee fee. Uh, with the stimulus act that we had previously, year before last, the guarantee fees were temporarily eliminated and we increased our guarantee to 90%, which really did spur our lending activity. Uh, currently, the fees are 2% of a loan request, that's $150,000 or less, uh, and it goes up to three and three quarter percent of the guaranteed portion when the loan is large, when you have a guaranteed portion in excess of a million dollars. So the guarantee fees can get quite hefty on the larger loans, and the fees are typically added into loan proceeds. We were talking about collateral earlier. SBA is not a collateral lender, uh, but because we're uh, lending and we're, we're functioning as an agency with taxpayer dollars, we have to be good stewards of those taxpayer dollars. So we do require collateral. The business owner has to pledge all available business assets to the extent that they're available, to the extent that the loan is fully secured if they are available. Um, so, you know, as, a, as, a, an, as an example, if the convenience store owner has no other assets than the inventory that they're gonna be purchasing with loan proceeds and everything else is favorable, we'll go ahead and approve that loan. On the other hand, if that mom and pop store have equity in their personal residence or in other real estate that they could pledge, we're gonna require that that be pledged as well. So we require the collateral to the extent that it's available and it covers the loan at liquidation value. Flip side is if they've pledged everything that they've got, they've got a good business plan, they've got a reasonable chance of repayment ability, we don't decline where the uh, lack of collateral is the only negative, where of course a bank would. Any owner of 20% or more, of course, uh, fully guarantees the loan. One of the most important documents that an entrepreneur or a small business owner will write, and hopefully will write again and again and again throughout the life of their business, is of course their business plan. Uh, Doug Gurley, SBDC state director, and his fine group of directors throughout the state do an awesome job of helping uh, people that you may be working with on a day-to-day -day basis get this done, get prepared, be ready to get in business, stay in business and, and grow. So I'm gonna just skip this part and let Doug talk about it. We've got um, the SPDCs are all listed in your resource guide. So wherever you are, there's one near you. And then of course, we've got a great online business plan tutorial at sba.gov. What SBA looks for are these things. We expect that the small business owner is of good character. There's a form that we have. You know, we're, we're a government agency, and of course we've got all these forms. One of the forms is, are you currently on probation or parole? If you are, you're not eligible. We get calls from people who are currently incarcerated who are being told that they are considered a minority through SBA and that they get special consideration. Well, that's not true. Uh, if you're currently on probation or parole, you're not eligible. If you've had issues in your past, uh, we'll have to get some additional information from you. If it's a non-felony, 
If you were streaking naked across your college campus 20 years ago, and that's the only thing you've ever done in your entire life, we can clear it at the district level. If you murdered your spouse or committed any other felony, then we'll have to get your fingerprints and we'll have to go off to the big black hole in Washington and they'll take months, literally, to get a response back. So you have to be of good character. You need to have a feasible business plan. You need to have that management experience or be able to show that you're able to hire experienced management. Um, sufficient funds to operate your business on a sound financial basis. If you go through your business plan and you determine that it's gonna take you $100,000 to successfully operate this business, and the bank says we can't give you 100, we'll give you 50, what is your response? Is no, because if you've determined you need 50, I mean 100, then don't take less than 100, because the thing that's gonna shut you down quicker than anything else is a lack of operating capital on the front side. So make sure you've got sufficient funds to operate your business. Uh, you've gotta have adequate equity. If you're a startup, we're gonna require that you have an injection in, into the project yourself, some skin in the game yourself. There's no preset amount. I hear quite frequently that SBA requires 33%, uh, but there's no predetermined amount. We're gonna look at each case and each business uh, on its own merits. And the most important indication is repayment ability. If you're an existing business, uh, how has the business operated historically? Has cash flow been sufficient to service the debt? If the answer is no, then you're gonna provide projections that show us you're gonna change some mode in your operation that's gonna increase your revenues or decrease your expenses and increase your, your cash flow. If you're a startup, then uh, you'll provide projections which Doug Shop can also assist you with. Now I mentioned we're, we're, the, we're the government, most of you guys are government as well, and we're covered up with paper and bureaucracy. One thing that SBA has tried to do over the years is to reduce the paperwork and eliminate some of the bureaucracy. So in our express programs, we allow certain lenders with experience to apply to SBA to become delegated lenders. SBA Express, which you see here, Patriot Express and Go Loans are all programs that are offered by our delegated lenders. Lenders with lots of experience that know SBA policy rules and regulations can apply to become delegated lenders and we allow them the authority to process loans to approval on behalf of SBA. There's three pages. The bank uses their own internal processes, documents, and procedures so a person could actually come into the bank, apply using the bank's application forms, bank approves it, then they submit to SBA electronically three forms, we reply back with a loan number. So within 24 hours, uh, a bank can have an SBA approval, which is a huge change from when I first started with SBA where you had to write the book this thick, you know, it was like a half a foot deep and we still needed additional information. So we've made some huge strides in reducing the paperwork that's required. In Express, a lender can process a loan up to $350,000 with a 50% guarantee. So you see the bank has more risk in this program um, and likely they're only gonna be approving these loans to their existing customers, those that they're very comfortable with. Whoops. Page 25 of your resource guide is gonna list lenders that have delegated authority with SBA. This resource guide is old, the new one's in print now, so we've added several new uh, lenders as delegated lenders. Now the Go Loan Gulf Opportunity Pilot Program is a loan program that was created immediately following Hurricane Katrina for businesses located in disaster declared counties. Uh, each, it was a pilot program with a 12 month expiration. But each year since Katrina, we've been successfully able to have that program renewed. It's currently set to expire September 30th, but we're hoping that we'll be able to get it renewed again, especially in light of the, the oil spill. But in the Go Loan, same express type processing and platform, uh, up to $150,000 with a full guarantee. So in this program, the bank, rather than the 50% they get in express, will get an 85% guarantee. Uh, business does not have to have been in existence during Katrina. They don't have to have incurred any damage. They can be a startup moving into one of the disaster declared counties, which most of Mississippi was declared disaster. And this is just a listing of the counties. So this of course has been a very, very popular program. Uh, SBA Express, same expedited process, but this one is specifically for veterans, our military members, 
their spouses and or widows, where uh, they could walk into their local bank with delegated authority and uh, the bank could approve a loan up to $500,000, SBA's full guarantee of 75 and 85 percent, two minutes, uh, using those doc their, the bank's internal documents, processes, and procedures. Dealer floor plan. A lot of you have seen and heard um, the news about automobile dealers having to shut down because they've lost their ability to floor plan their inventory. New autos, used autos, the, the mom and pop shops on the corner. You've seen probably the RV trailer parks being shut down, moving all their inventory off their lots because they can't finance their inventory. Uh, SBA created the dealer floor plan program to help alleviate that problem. The unfortunate thing right now today is that very few lenders are experienced at financing dealer floor plans. So right now it's mainly the larger nation nationwide lenders that are involved. So we're trying to get some local banks uh, more active. Small Loan Advantage, brand new loan program, just getting kicked off the ground. It's for our existing larger PLP lenders, new platform to ease uh, the burden on the bank basically. And then Community Advantage, uh, was created through the Jobs Act, and what it does is it allows non-traditional lenders who in the past could not be an SBA guaranteed lender. Uh, Minority Capital Fund in Jackson, I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, but it allows lenders such as them with CDFI certification to become an SBA guaranteed lender where we could guarantee the loans that they're making to small businesses. 504, real quick, my last minute, this is a fixed asset financing tool where uh, larger projects that are either purchasing land and building or need to construct land and building, uh, really good program where the small business person approaches their bank, the bank finances 50% of the total need, the bank takes a first deed of trust. So they've got a first deed of trust with half of the cost. They're in a win-win situation. Uh, we come in behind them and through the sale of debentures, we finance 40% in a second deed of trust and then the small business comes to the table with 10%. Uh, Small uh, Jobs Act allows us now to temporarily refinance commercial real estate mortgages in the 504 program, which has never been allowed in the past. So because of the declining real estate values uh, and, and small businesses with balloon notes coming due, with the inability to refinance those commercial uh, mortgages, we now can refinance them in 504. The certified development companies, Larry Anderson at uh, Central Mississippi Planning and Development District in Jackson, and Mitch Montgomery with Three Rivers Planning and Development District in Pontotoc serve as SBA's agents in the 504. Our website, sba.gov, sba.gov forward slash MS for Mississippi. There's our contact information. All of our contact information is on page six in your resource guide. Thank you very much. Don't you ask me anything I can't answer about uh, I'll try not to. I don't know if this is on, but um, Rhonda, right after, uh, well, a couple years, about a year or so ago when they had the ARRA uh, program kick mm -hmm. in, there was funds available for uh, existing businesses that could have a deferred loan. Uh, is that program still available? And I, you'd have to give me the latest acronym on that. I, I thought it was the Patriot Loan, but it I It was that's America's it. Recovery Capital, or ARC loan, ARC. That's right. And it was for existing businesses who were having trouble servicing their existing debt. And with that loan, uh, they could borrow up to $35,000, and those loan proceeds were to be used solely to make monthly principal and interest payments on their existing debt. So over a six-month period, those funds could be used to make principal and interest uh, payments on their existing debt service. It's gone now, but it was a very popular program. As a matter of fact, People's Bank in Little Mendenhall, Mississippi, was the number three lender nationwide making those loans. So, so it's gone. Then. It's gone. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else real quick? Next question. We've got 10 minutes. We're we'll standing here and talk about anything we'll talk about. Okay, good. 
If you uh, have questions after you leave here and you're able to look at the resource guide, just feel free to call us. Uh, we're from the government and we're here to help you. I will, I will ask this question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, uh, program that affected the training system. Mm -hmm. If you had people in those counties that were all field counties, is there anything available for them right now? Can they qualify under this program? They can qualify under the government program. Um, of course, SBA serves as the disaster bank in the event of um, a federal disaster, just like Katrina. And that's the only program where we lend directly. So um, small businesses and homeowners and property owners after Katrina and or after the oil spill could apply to SBA for direct financing. Um, they can apply to SBA for the guarantee program as well, but the, if they incurred uh, economic or personal property injury, then the disaster loan is lower interest rate than what they'll get from their bank. So it'd be better to get the rate. Right. Okay. All right, thank y'all right. very much. Our next presenter will be Ms. Bernita Dorr. She'll come up and talk to us a little bit about USDA Rural uh, Development Business Program. Ready? I'm going to I'm going to try to move this here. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I need the mic this morning. Let's see if I can do this successfully. Will it go up some? Mm -hmm. Either that or I, or I need some. Gary, would you? Can, that's okay. I'll leave it here and I'll have Gary Jones, who's the Rural Business uh, Program Director here in Mississippi. You can, you can move it over. Can I do it? Come on, okay. Don't worry about it. I don't want to mess up a good thing. All right. And how do I click forward? Is it here? In for next. Or In for next. Right. Or P for previous. Okay. Here's next. This one? Yep. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I'm so happy to be here today. <laughs> it's always good to travel with capable people. Thank you, Ronnie. Now. Thank you so much. That might get you a little more flexibility. This is good. It's so good to be here in Mississippi. It, it's a little bit of distance from Beaufort, South Carolina, and from the state's capital in Columbia, but it was certainly worth the trip. And I hope that the things that I talk with you about today will be able to benefit you and the communities that you serve. I want to make sure everyone knows that partnership is extremely important to us because we can't do it alone. And then with the funds being as they are now, we really have to work together to build relationships, to work together and make our communities the best that they can be. And what I'd like to tell you today is that rural development stands ready to work with you. And I hope that you will join us in making your communities what it can and should be. At Rural Development, our mission is to increase economic opportunity for all citizens in rural America. Our vision is a rural America that is a safe, healthy, and prosperous place in which to live and work. In other words, we want our rural communities to thrive. So as I give you this presentation, let's work together to help our communities. I can't overemphasize that. Yes, ma'am? Could you point out the typical problems our using your programs and how we might overcome them? Sure. What I think I will do is at the end, we'll go back over it and then address those. And what we hope that those problems were in the past would be opportunities. I would first of all say this, that some of the problems that we had um, were with the lack of vision on either side, but I will tell you that a lot of that has been rectified because we have people on the ground in our agency that want to help you and want to build a relationship and want to help make your community move forward. But we'll go over that and I'll appreciate your questions at the end. We have over 40 different programs in rural development to help build communities. We'd like to say that we can build a community from the ground up, and we have done so, many communities. We have different funding sources. We have grants 
direct loans and guaranteed loans. We have 13 uh, business and cooperative programs, and they're all outlined there. The ones in red are the ones that are used most frequently. They're the business and indus industrial guaranteed loans, the rural business enterprise grants, the rural economic development loans and grants, and we call them red legs. Our objective in the business and industry program is to create jobs and stimulate rural economies by providing financial backing through grants, direct loans, and loan guarantees, and again, partnerships. The beneficiaries are commercial lenders, local residents, businesses, local governments, nonprofits, and the like. <coughs> Most of our BNI programs cannot exceed 50,000 population. We have our IRP, or the Immediary Relending Program, whose population cannot exceed 25,000 and we have a value-added producer grant, which is statewide. We have private sector financing, guaranteed marketable, uh, improved terms, bank loan forms for our application. These things that are listed here is what makes our business and industrial guaranteed loan uh, mesh with that of private industry. Again, with this uh, loan, the Community Reinvestment Act, <coughs> is one of the things that help to make businesses interested in doing work with us because as you, as you have heard before, the banks are in business to make money, but rural development is in business so that we can create uh, communities that are prosperous and thriving. Also with this program, it does not count against the lender's limits. Who can apply? Well, it's the federal or state chartered lending institutions. You all right? Can you hear me? The volume is not quite very. Can, can y'all not hear me? Not as good in the back. Let's see if we can turn it up a little. I don't see how to turn it up here. <coughs> no. We'll try this. All right, go ahead. Okay, and I'll try to project a little bit more. All right. Can you hear me now? Do I need to go back? Did you miss something? Okay, all right. Again, any federal or state chartered lending institution, credit unions, savings and loans, insurance companies regulated by the state or federal agency, they can be our applicant. And we're looking for credit worthy borrowers. This is how it works. You can apply through the lender or through and rural development area. I hate a script because I like to talk to people, but I don't want to miss anything, so I'm going to be meshing both. Um, what you need to know is that you apply at the lender, you're with the lender. You go to a lender of your choice, tell them about our program, a lot of them know about our programs, and then you make application through them. The bank or the lender is Rural Development's uh, applicant, okay? Who's eligible? A borrower may be a cooperative organization, corporation, partnership, or any other legal entity organized and operated on a profit or nonprofit basis, an Indian tribe or a federal or state reservation, or any other federally recognized tribal group, public body, or individual. The uses of the loan is numerous. Uh, are numerous. You have acquisitions and startups for real estate, con construction, capital, working capital, inventory to refinance for uh, any tourist and recreational facility except for golf courses, uh, housing developments, but you must show the need for housing to save jobs because again, our program is to create jobs and stimulate the economy. Also renewable energy and energy efficient projects. This is an example of what we have done in South Carolina and it's one of many examples. This was for debt refinancing <coughs> on an inn in Aiken, South Carolina. It was $1.6 million. Another example where we created jobs and stimulated the economy was Turnstile Industry in Georgetown, South Carolina. It was a $3 million loan for working capital, refinancing for machinery and equipment. With our loan guarantee, we can guarantee up to 90% of your need, but 90% is for those communities that were affected by NAFTA. Other than that, 
it's 80 percent for loans that are five million or less, 70 percent for loans that are five to ten million dollars, 60 percent for loans greater than 10 million, and anything over 25 million, it goes up to Washington and the Secretary of Agriculture will have to approve that. Our loans are very, very flexible. This is our Rural Business and Enterprise Grant. Very flexible, very popular. The allocation comes to the state office and it's a pot of money that the state director has for discretionary giving to communities. Um, typically it's a little less than a million, but we try to stretch it as much as we can and um, so that it's kind of seed money to go back to communities again to create jobs and stimulate the economy. Examples of our Rural Business Enterprise Grants, which we call our bags. We gave a $99,000 grant to Greenville County um, for a farmer's market. Again, it created jobs and it's also a, a, a part of a healthy uh, initiative, Healthy Starts Initiative. Another example is the Carolina Foothills Artisan Center, where art local artisans are able to display their crafts and we have visitors come in and they buy this, the, the goods. Our artists are getting more popularity and again it's creating wealth not only for our artists but it's bringing tourists to that community and therefore creating jobs, stimulating the economy. The uses of the grants, you can use that grant for a revolving loan fund, you can use it for infrastructure, buildings and equipment, for technical assistance, distant learning networks, and so on, and the so ons we'll discuss during the question and answer session. Application and terms, the applicant applies to their local rural development office and it's reviewed annually for funding after June 30th by the state office, my office. We give priority points and geographical allocation to area offices. For example, we have some offices that are in persistent poverty counties. Obviously, they would rank just a little bit higher because the need is greater there. Eligible loan purposes, our b &I acquisitions, business construction, conversion, enlargement, modernization, purchase and development of land, rights of ways, leases, materials, purchases of equipment, machinery, leasehold improvements, supplies, and the like. We can explore additional um, purposes shortly. Again, <laughs> pollution control, transportation, feasibility studies, debt financing, educational institutions, these are some more examples of what the dollars can be used for. Now, this is our favorite, the rural, rural Economic Development Loans and Grants. I referred to it earlier as um, a red leg. What we encourage you to do in this is to know your cooperative board. In every community, in every county, they have a co-op. At least we'd like to think so. Do, are you all familiar with your co-ops here in Mississippi? Very good. Um, we offer gap financing, and which enhances the cash flow and increased our leveraging opportunities. These are examples of our red legs. We gave a $600,000 um, red leg to Blue Ridge, to Pickens County, for the expansion and purchase of new equipment. Now, again, with the application process, you'd go to the electric or telephone co-op that either had a loan with us or currently have a loan with us. Yeah, most qualify in South Carolina, and most would qualify in Mississippi as well. The, oper the cooperatives apply to rural development. Again, just like with B&I, you do not come directly to us except with the idea, and then you go to your lender. With this program, the cooperative is our applicant. You go to your co-op, you tell them what it is that you need, and encourage them to come to us. In addition, you'll call us and say, hey, I've got this idea and I want our co-op to work with, with, them, with us. Can you talk with them? And we do that. Again, the common thread, the theme, the song, the refrain in rural business is to create jobs and stimulate the economy. We all know in the day of recession that we have now, and even before this, jobs are so important to our rural citizens, and we have to work together, pool all of our resources, state, national, local, private citizens to create jobs and stimulate the economy. 
All right, the uses for our red leg are business startups and expansions, machinery and equipment, revolving loan funds, community facilities, infrastructure, technical assistance, medical facilities, and the list continues to go on. The terms, and hear me out, 0% interest rate for 10 years. Anybody heard of a better term than that? And there's no mistake, there's no typographical error. I didn't misspeak, 0% percent interest rate for over 10 years, for up to 10 years. And how does it happen? The cooperative, we give it to the co cooperative, is passed through them to businesses. The grant, the loan is for up to $740,000. The grant is $300,000. On the grant part, create, the grant creates a revolving loan fund that is loaned out for the first time to nonprofits or public body for community and economic development at 0% for 10 years as well. And then it can be loaned out again and again. But when it's loaned out the first time, the cooperative lends it out at 0%. After that, if the cooperative wanted to make some money, they could loan it out for 1% or maybe 2%. In South Carolina, I do not recall it being reloaned for anything more than 1%. But it is an opportunity there. What does it take? to make this happen? How do we create jobs? How do we stimulate the economy? It takes partnerships, partnerships of community leaders like yourselves. It takes an interest in your community. And it takes rural development to revitalize our communities and the possibilities are endless. I think I'm right on time, am I Ronnie? At this time, I'm going to invite Gary Jones, the Business and Industry Program Director for Mississippi, to join me to talk with you about our energy programs and to help me answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your time, and I hope that I have brought to you something that you can use for your communities. Biofuel, and the advanced feedstock would be a feedstock other than corn. 
they can receive a, a payment each year. And this program uh, was implemented on last year in 2000, well, 2009. Now this is the third year it's uh, been available. But we have, you can have uh, biofuel, biodiesel type operations that are using advanced feedstock applied to this particular program to receive a payment. Also, the 904 program is a program we have for biofuel operations, biodiesel operations that are looking to change the way that they uh, use energy for their particular operations. If they can be, if they're using a fossil fuel and they're using, looking to use a advanced technology for the energy for their particular project or their particular facility, they can apply for funding to help them assist in making those changes to their particular operations to use another <coughs> of, uh, fuel for production of energy other than a fossil fuel. Primarily those are the energy programs that we have that are also available to the digital, the ones that were discussed earlier. Um, I guess we're not ready for questions. Yes. Right here, uh, you had concern about the timing. Could you could we revisit that, or did you feel like I addressed it properly? Did y'all hear the question? She wanted to know. Let her use the mic. What she asked was, uh, could I tell her how to, or tell you all, how to avoid the different uh, delays or obstacles with using the rural development program? Is that what I heard you say? Um, generally, in using, it's on. Oh, generally, in using USDA programs, we all hear about typical issues. One of them might be credit uh, scores oh. being very difficult. Okay. Could you tell us what the issues are with using your programs and how we might help? the people we serve to better use them. And I'll give an example to use USDA housing programs before the housing crisis, mm -hmm. when everybody else needed a 580 credit score, your typical poor rural customer needed a 640 credit or a 620 credit score at the time. How do we deal with those um, kind of dramatic differences in how our rural families or rural businesses are treated? How do we get them to be able to use your programs? Well, that's a very good question and thank you for asking. Um, with regard to the credit score, that's what we've got to work with. And um, I think that most of us that work on the rural development team, we are from rural America, and a lot, of, a lot of us have used the programs that are available either in our communities or people in the church or wherever. And so what you express is a concern of ours as well. Now, there are other factors other than the, the 620 score, which I'm not really familiar with. And I've worked with this. Uh, the housing program is what got me, my hook with this agency because I was able to see how much good we've done for so many people. Now, there has to be another uh, part to that 620 score because the last I heard was 580 and I don't remember it changing. Hmm. Well, I can't address that any more than what I've said because we do not make the, the rules on the local level, but we have to enforce them. Uh, credit issues and credit worthiness is an issue that uh, affects everyone, everyone, because with uh, resources dwindling, you don't have but so much to work with, and we really are sympathetic to that, and we really do understand from a first-hand knowledge of how it is to live in rural America when the jobs don't pay as much as maybe some the cities or some urban areas. Uh, with regard to our business program, unfortunately, creditworthiness comes to play as well, but we try to offset it by saying, hey, Mr. Linder, we're guaranteeing you this loan. And in those persistent poverty counties that were affected by NAFTA, we said 90% guarantee? I think you can make this loan to Mr. Brown. I think you can make it to Miss Sarah, because we're guaranteeing 90%, and we're the United States federal government. Now, with regard to single family housing again, the lender, a lot of them, um, come through us and have certain criteria, but when it comes to the lender, we encourage the lender to make those guaranteed loans because, Mr. Lender, we're guaranteeing 100% of this. So it's not just the 620 uh, credit score. There are some other extenuating circumstances. So, And I do remember that. It's not just the credit score. There's some other um, circumstances that, that, we, um, that we look at. Somebody else asked me a question, please. Well, I mean, I'd also say that I know on our on the Bible two side it's lower lower income, low housing criteria. Our people work very closely with with, with these clients too to take the credit score. They look at the score, they look at what these debts are, how you can how you can go in and make clear some of these debts off the credit record, get your credit score back in a better position. May take six months, may take Try to give some guidance and direction on how to clear this up where they can become eligible. 
Thank you. Thank you for adding that because I agree with you. I know that sometimes it takes a year or two even, but we take it very, very seriously. Again, most of our employees are from rural America, and we will work with you. We will look at your application and say, if you really want a house, this is what you need to do. And I will report to you that a lot of people, I won't say all of them, but I would say a good 40 percent, really take home ownership seriously and work with us to help us with the tools that we have to make them a successful homeowner. One thing I would just add to that, <coughs> one thing we try to do also is identify credit counseling organizations and other nonprofits and different organizations available that can also assist with the applicants who may initially have some issues that will cause them not to be able to qualify, but we don't just send them away saying you don't qualify. We right. follow up, we work with them, we work with those uh, nonprofits and credit counseling organizations to assist those applicants. So at some point, they can come back to us and be a uh, successful homeowner. Wonderful. Other questions? If there are no other questions, and I know my time is up, I want to remind you that it is our responsibility to work together to find common ways, just like I'm so glad the guys were here to help me with that because the history is we do try. If it doesn't work right away, we do tell you, we do provide uh, counseling. Uh, either through our own agency or through some other partner to help people get where they need to be. And we try to encourage people that even though you may not be where you need to be today, you have to have a plan. And with a plan, we can get there. And with that, I thank you all so much for taking the time to come out to learn a little bit more about rural development. And I hope that I've helped you with some information to take back to your communities. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Okay, our next presenter, Mr. Doug Gurley, who's the Small Business Administration. Uh, sir? Stop Small Business Development, I'm sorry, uh, here in the state of Mississippi. And we're most appreciative to have him here with us today. Um, your PowerPoint. Let's see where it is. Can you hear me? Does this thing work? I can't hear worth the flip over. Okay, while well, he's looking for a PowerPoint, my name is Doug Gurley. I am State Director of Mississippi Small Business Development Center Network. I grew up in uh, Mississippi. I was born in Holly Springs. Yeah. And uh, I've been, I grew up in small business. I've owned small businesses. I did about 10 years in the Navy. I was in Navy Special Operations, where I was uh, what they call an explosive ordnance disposal technician, oh, and right. disarmed bombs for a living. And uh, used jumping out of planes and diving to get to them. And you want to talk about something that will make you uh, concentrate on excellence. What happens if you make a mistake? Still got them, OK? All right. I've been 14 years, or I've worked 14 years as state director. During that time, I've been on numerous committees, and um, I worked at the national level, did four years on the national uh, board. We have a national association. Did eight years on our national accreditation committee going all over the United States, uh, reviewing uh, other state programs. If you don't pass accreditation, you don't get funded. We do it every four years. We use the Baldrige criteria, if any of you have ever heard of that like an ISO 9000. Um, Doug, what's your presentation name? Do you know? Say again? What is the name of your presentation? It should be. So we know she got her. She printed this out. Wow. You don't remember? It should have been resource partners. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
another thing I've been doing over the last seven years is making numerous trips to Mexico to different states in Mexico, uh, helping them set up their small business development center network statewide, I mean nationwide, uh, to improve uh, importing and exporting, especially in areas like Tabasco and Veracruz, which are just right across the Gulf from us. I went to school, uh, undergrad at Chaminade University of Honolulu, a private Catholic business school. I went there because all the professors were retired PhDs who could afford one and two million dollar homes and I figured they know what they were doing. Yeah, I like to learn from experts. Uh, I came back, uh, went to Ole Miss, got my master's in public administration and I did all my coursework for a PhD in public administration. I'm married to uh, Donna Gurley. She is the associate attorney for the University of Mississippi, or Ole Miss, and uh, I'm glad to be down here. Thank you very much. All right, buddy, are we ready? Error or hand? Yes. Okay. Can you still hear? Can you hear me very well? Okay. All right, again, good morning, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks to all our uh, resource partners that are out there. Uh, we have Mr. Hamp Bating. Hamp, if you would stand up. This is a guy who can really answer your questions. Um, he runs the Mississippi State University SBDC here. And uh, Hamp is one of our best counselors out in the field. And he's right here. So if you have any questions, specific questions, he's got to talk to. This is our new building. We just, uh, Senator Cochran gave us uh, money to build this building. We just opened it, it houses the state office and the uh, University of Mississippi uh, SBDC program. Uh, we built it a little different. We wanted it to look like a state building because we represent a state program even though we're housed at the University of Mississippi. Okay, we operate on a uh, total an annual budget of uh, a little bit less than $2 million. Uh, these are our economic impact. We operate on a federal fiscal year. Uh, we work with three types of clients. We work with the existing business that takes a large percentage of our uh, time and funding. We work with startups and then we work with pre-ventures. Preventures are those who are thinking about going into business and how we do deal with them, we put them in group workshops as much as possible. Then we sit there and we explain to them how they're going to work 80 hour work weeks, pay quarterly taxes, vacation, don't worry about it, you're not going to get one. And then at the end of that, uh, about 9 out of 10 leave and go back home and decide to stay doing what they were doing which means they don't go bankrupt. Who pays for that? We do. They don't lose their children's education fund, things like that. Who pays for that? We do. So they are given the facts to make a correct decision. I think that's probably the greatest benefit we do. There's no data on that. So. Also, I have one of the uh, uh, counselors come up to me. He, was, he used to uh, manage the uh, state quality award program. He said, did you know that we created, about every 18 months we create jobs equal to the Toyota plant? And I went, huh, that's interesting. This is our breakdown on counseling and training. We do know from national studies, annual studies, and we have a guy here named Jim Christman that's been with the SBDC program about 14, 15 years. Uh, he's now at Mississippi State University. And we do know that if you work with an SBDC, you have a 40% better chance of surviving and staying in business than if you don't. More of our uh, data and services we offer. You can read these and you've got a handout. Uh, client demographic data. The clients we serve throughout Mississippi. Uh, 
course, the male, female, that's pretty much close on target. Ah, uh, this is the biggie. Every time we have a client come in, we ask them to do a client satisfaction rating on the services they've received. We carry an 87.31% excellent <coughs> rating from our clients. And I'm not talking about two or 300 clients. I'm talking about thousands of clients. Okay? I want to know that. I think the reason we carry this is a lot, the majority of our directors and counselors are retirees who've been in management and have owned small businesses. And when people come in, uh, they know that and they listen. One of the things also is that our services, we were created to provide services to anybody. We, we're not, we can't say we're just gonna do veterans, we can't just do minorities, we can't just do women. We have to handle the whole gamut. These are some of the comments that our people, our clients put uh, regarding uh, the services they've received. These go in a uh, weekly stakeholder newsletter that we send out, and there's a couple pages of them. Uh, when I go to DC, I handed uh, Senator Cochran's staffer 64 pages of 12 per page, front and back. These are what our clients say that we're doing, okay? This is a breakdown of the types of clients we counseled. And as you can see, for every 10 pre-ventures that we see, one starts our business, okay? Then I've broken down into unique clients. For every dollar invested in the MSBDC, we help our clients create 30.96 in capital formation. Okay. These are where the SBDCs are located throughout the state. We also have what we call the business assistance centers. That's where part-time retirees, uh, we have areas where there's only like one or two hundred hours of work in a year. So we have these <coughs> part-timers like Sonny Fisher, who is, uh, who's over in Meridian and does, they do the old circuit riding, and they go through and do counseling and training. Uh, but this is our main location, that's our contact information. Um, you know, you're a resource partner for us, and why should you trust us and use our services? I'm gonna give you a couple reasons. One is the client satisfaction data, what our clients say about us, your constituents and how they rate us. Uh, second is uh, we use Franklin Covey. Franklin Covey has something they call the execution quotient. It means what did you really do? How did you execute your plan? On a scale, they have a, they did about 12,000 organizations when we, were, when we first took the first one. And on a scale of zero to 100, the norm is 46. We scored a 77. Our last one was an 87. We scored the highest they've ever had, and Franklin Covey is international. I met with Dr. Covey, and he signed it for us, and I said, if you ever need help, come to Mississippi. We'll help you, okay? Next thing is Baldridge. Our national accreditation is based on Baldridge. Baldridge is based on needs assessment, constant client needs assessment and stakeholder. What do you need? So we're, we're built on that. We're not built on what's the latest fad or what does a politician want. We're built on what the client needs. So all our operations run off of that, okay? So we as a state organization will go for the National Bullridge Award put in our first application in 2014. The only other organization I know in the state that's done that is the hospital in Tupelo. They give out six awards a year and only one in each category. So why are we doing that? Effectiveness. The higher, more effective we are, the more effective we can be with our clients. I'm from Mississippi. Every time I see about Mississippi, I see how we're ranked number 50. Well, I hate to tell you this, I don't like being number 50. I like being number one. Worst number two. Most of Mississippians I've run into out in the real world out there, 
they're pretty sharp. They're good. Last Mississippi program, the Mississippi SBDC program, is over 30 years old. We've been doing this a long time. We're good at it. We work hard at it. We have a great team. And we, um, no, we ask that you send us your referrals. We'll contact you back. If you send us somebody, we'll let you know what we're doing. We won't tell you specifics, but we'll let you know they're being handled. We'll take care of them. How many of you like to have contact back when you do something like that? Am I the only one? No. I like it. What if they call me? Well, I sent you to so-and-so, and they said they were doing this. Feels good, doesn't it? It's called professional. We like it. As you can see, again, our locations, is, this is our website. You can go there. We have DVDs and online training um, for clients. Uh, our email address, my personal email address is wgurley, G-U-R-L-E-Y, I know, at olemiss.edu. Okay. Uh, our weekly newsletter, if you want on that, if you'll put that in your uh, email, we'll put you on a weekly. If you want on the client newsletter, it goes out every month, we'll put you on that. Just send me an email and let me know. Again, I thank you for uh, taking time out of your business schedule. <coughs> come and listen to me. <coughs> Thank you very much.